for, while we're waiting for the rest of the physical audience to come into the room, I just want to remind everyone, have a look at the app you've been sent a link to, because that's the forum in which people are exchanging views, where you can find like-minded people, you can talk to people in the Climate Bonds team if you've got questions, and generally find out more about Green Bonds. Also, the Climate Bonds website, which, as you would guess, is called climatebonds.net. If you search for Climate Bonds, you'll find it. It's full of resources, reports, including around transitions and taxonomies. And today, we're launching a fast-track certification scheme I mentioned earlier. We're launching our finalised cement industry taxonomy criteria, and we're also launching a 101 ideas for governments to get to 1.5, fiscally efficient, in draft form, looking for comments. That is, we're beseeching, we're asking, we're pleading with you. See, would tell us what you think. And we'll keep improving that with the idea of a more substantial launch for the COP in Egypt a little later this year. A lot of the work that we do, that everyone needs to do in this market, is iterative. That is, we need to keep improving. We're not going to be perfect, at least not until we've managed to stabilise the global climate. We'll keep learning and keep improving. And that includes in the detail, like the 101 guide that we're publishing, where we'll continue to ask for ideas from a vast group of people around the world, like yourselves, that are thinking about this and trying to think about what to do. The next panel that we're about to run is on the topic of taxonomies. Now, I call taxonomies the shopping list for the future. It is a shopping list. You've heard me say, if you've been here earlier today, that we need to make an understanding of what to do simple and clear. While we have formulas, we will slow development and growth of this market. If we can find ways to say, here's how you tell whether something qualifies, it's pretty simple, things will change quite quickly. Financial markets grow on the back of commoditization and standardization. That underpins the theory behind all of this. A little bit of a story about the history of taxonomies. The green bond market grew out of an initiative by the World Bank and the European Investment Bank before that, the real initiator, but theirs was called the Climate Awareness Bond in 2008, to attract new investors to their books. In the ESG framing that had been common in the 10 years prior to that, the analysis was about entities, was about companies not about what companies were doing, except insofar it affected the tracking filters, ESG filters, on top of companies. What that meant was there weren't many companies that qualified. For the level of equity investment at the time, there were more than enough. But the bond market is A, larger, and B, dominated by higher rated. And there weren't that many companies that were higher rated that were meeting the ESG criteria that were common at that time, including a lot of development banks that were being excluded who didn't have equity for a start and wanted to try and place investments. So when people were looking at ESG, they were trying to find a company that qualified they could invest in. The Climate, the climate Awareness Bond issued by the European Investment Bank was designed to bring new investors to the book who hadn't been part of the European Investment Bank's fixed income client list prior because they were investing the proceeds in activities that were seen to be of interest to, in this case, Scandinavian investors. It worked. Very soon afterwards, the World Bank copied the idea in the Green Bond. But a little bit of a secret history of the World Bank Green Bond. When they first knocked on the door, Yolanda might remember this, she was around then, they first knocked on the door of investors in Scandinavia and said, we want to do a green bond, 
like the European Investment Bank, here's where we plan to use the proceeds. Swedish investors, who can be very sceptical and very tough, said, I'm just not sure about your portfolio that you're allocating funds to. And also, your CEO, Robert Zolik, at the time, is not exactly known as a greenie. The World Bank had just funded a coal-fired power station in South Africa, very controversially at the time, and they said, oh, we're not convinced. Cicero was then approached at the University of Oslo's Climate Change Research Centre by SEB Bank in what was a daring and great idea. Let's get a trusted body to review what they're doing and see if that can assuage the concerns of the investors in Sweden. Well, it worked. By getting an independent review by a trusted actor, in this case, the University of Oslo's Climate Change Research Centre, an internationally well-regarded institution, the green bond from the World Bank was able to be placed, but there were some changes made. This isn't common, this isn't in the official history of the World Bank. But at that time, they had included the retrofitting of coal-fired power stations in their portfolio of green assets. Climate scientists have never been happy about this, let me be very clear about that. But the World Bank at the time was still including that as green. Cicero said, oh, I don't think I can sign off on that. After a bit of argy-bargy, the World Bank did remove those loans from their portfolio. Very significant win. A climate focus became the dominant agenda in that particular age, and scientists had the final say about what qualified. Two important lessons for the development of this market. The independent review was established as a norm. It did take a few years for the European Investment Bank to catch up, but then they've tended to be seen as a bit more trusted on their climate credentials, especially as now they've become a climate bank. 50% of all lending goes towards climate mitigation, and the other 50% on things like roads has to be climate resilient. So there's a whole resilience agenda added there. We established the idea of the independent review. Things took, took off. But in that science advice was this kernel of an idea of if we could systemize and commoditize this advice, maybe things will grow really fast. When in 2013, the IFC issued $2 billion benchmark bonds that were sold out two and a half times oversubscribed in one and a half hours, which excited the market and got everyone thinking, especially in the corporate world, this could actually work. We also launched the climate bonds, the climate bonds taxonomy and certification scheme. And this was a guidance to the market. About 15% of the global green bonds market is now uses the certification scheme based on taxonomy. In 2014, 15, the People's Bank of China adopted one of the recommendations we'd made in the Green Finance Task Force, headed by Dr. Ma Jun at the time, to establish green bonds market and a taxonomy, the Green Projects Catalogue. And they said, because we can't afford to allow interpretation by provinces and actors, otherwise there'll be all sorts of rubbish. So um, that has grown. That has been a critical piece of architecture for the growth of the Chinese green bond market, now the world's second largest, and we think possibly the world's largest in this coming year, for a variety of reasons. A couple of years later, the European Commission agreed to another recommendation from the high-level expert group and stable finance I was a member of, to establish one, and now we have the EU taxonomy, which is, let's just say, driving awareness in Europe. It's being used not just for green bonds, but also for the sustainable investment disclosure regime that affects all companies, major companies, banks, and investors in Europe, who will be disclosing annually around their sustainable investments. That taxonomy is a bit more work in progress. We'll hear a little bit more from Nadia Humphreys in a minute, who will, who will join us. But you can sort of see how this has gone. And now, of course, we have the Singaporean taxonomy. We have the Vietnamese taxonomy. We will soon have the Thai taxonomy. We hope to have, next year, the Hong Kong taxonomy. The Indian taxonomy is in published in draft form. And I'm going to say we've had a bit of involvement as client bonds, not all of these, to varying degrees, with an objective of keeping them broadly aligned. You heard in the earlier session about the need for harmonisation. It's a work in progress, but we are a long way along that road. There's necessary tailoring for different markets, but broad 
broad acceptance. There are differences. Yolanda might pick out a couple of those because she's been in the thick of those. But the, the methodology is largely the same. Is the key thing to note. And it's going global. Taxomania, we like to call it. A key part of these taxonomies, a key feature, is the science base, the necessity of reflecting necessary ambition. Yes, make it easy, but yes, be rigorous. Sort out some of the boundary issues, and above all, avoid the accusations of greenwashing that investors don't want to have to be tarred with. Heading off problems is a key part of it. In some ways, it's also now become a risk predictor. That is, taxonomies are being used by investors in Europe as a universe of investments that are less likely to be negatively impacted by future policy changes and more likely to be positively supported by policy impact. In other words, a lower risk universe. Now that is exciting and that's driving price movements and all sorts of other things. But let's hear more about it. I would like to invite onto the stage, first, Yolanda Chung, who's the head of sustainability at DBS and has a history as long as your arm working on sustainable finance. One of the heroes of sustainable finance. I'd also like to invite on screen, and hopefully our tech people can get the screen going, Eugene Wong, who's the CEO of the Sustainable Finance Institute of Asia, is, has used to be at the Malaysian Securities Commission, and is currently advising the ASEAN Taxonomy Board, made up of central banks and regulators, on ASEAN approaches to transition taxonomy. And if I can get one of my team just to see if we can get the screen working, that'd be wonderful, because we need to be able to see our speakers on screen. And also we'll be joining us in a minute, Nadia Humphreys, who is the head of Sustainable Finance Solutions at Bloomberg, based in London, and also a member of the Platform of Sustainable Finance with me in Europe. But perhaps more pertinently, She's a bit senior than me because she's the co-rapporteur of the usability work group of the platform of stable finance. And she's going to tell us a little bit about that. I'm going to sit down and here they all are. Nadia, thank you for joining us at 8 a.m. in London. Uh, luckily, it wasn't 5 a.m. She got a terribly frightening email alert earlier that, um, that worried her about her sleep. And, um, and thank you, Eugene, for joining us from Vietnam. Uh, I'm going to ask Nadia to he take us into this discussion first, if I may. Nadia, can you tell us about where we are in Europe and what's happening next, especially around usability? No audio, folks. Uh, Shawnee, is this That's any better? Can you hear me? Much better. Thank you, Nadia. No, no worries at all. Thank you so much for inviting me. And apologies, Yolanda, to see, see you sitting there quite lonely in, in, in the panel. Uh, well done on the hybrid event, Sean. Um, and, and thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, in terms of the European market, maybe if I just start with, with kind of what we're seeing in terms of demand. Um, so I recently looked at the European ETF market. Um, and what I looked at was whether or not there are flows to sustainable products. Um, so in Europe, there's a classification system. Uh, and forgive me for using numbers, but an Article 8 or 9 product is, is deemed to be sustainable to varying degrees. Um, so an, an 8 uh, favours environmental or social characteristics, and a 9 has environmental or social objectives. And when I looked at the European market, what I was seeing is yeah, about 25% of, of AUM is sitting on these sustainable products. Um, and last year, I saw that for the first time, 51% of flows started to move into these sustainable products. Um, so over tipping those flows into normal or non-sustainable. Um, there's been some bad press about ESG and sustainability this year. And I looked very recently at year-to-date flows into these products. And really interestingly, 58%. So it's still growing. Uh, and for me, what does that mean? That means that there is real demand for sustainable financial products. Um, and there is really, in my opinion, no better tool for this 
than a common framework like a taxonomy that directs and clarifies exactly how much sustainability you are getting, given that there is clearly demand for this. Um, and I think particularly where that is useful in the Asian market is to attract international capital, being able to very clearly articulate and explain how environmentally sustainable your investment product is. Using a narrative like a taxonomy is going to be critically important. Now, Sean asked me to also just touch upon a couple of things in the EU. Uh, so one thing, and, and Sean, forgive me, because I, I, this is absolutely my favourite anecdote, and it is totally stolen from you. Um, but, you know, a taxonomy is a very complicated beast. And I think what Sean does is he relates it to an electric car, which, you know, the nuts and bolts and technology that goes into creating one is incredibly complex. But at the end of the day, you sit in it and press the go button and it starts to move. And um, we are still in that place of construction in the taxonomy. Uh, and so what you will see next week is a report from the platform to the European Commission on usability in the market, not only of taxonomy, but the broader sustainable finance framework. Um, I will admit uh, uh, the latest draft is it's just shy of 180 pages, so it's not something to digest in one sitting, uh, but it does cover some very useful advice from the platform that ultimately is from the market to the Commission on how to make this framework more usable, particularly to financial markets. Um, and I would definitely point people to that report in terms of kind of with hindsight lessons learned on adoption of taxonomies locally um, and definitely the way to stimulate financial flows rather than create, you know, a cumbersome or, or burdening system. Um, I'll, I'll pause there, Sean, and, and allow the other speakers to introduce themselves as well. Thank you so much. Um, that comment about flows going into sustainable finance, percentage flows, is really interesting. We've had this conversation in Europe, and Rahul Sheth, I wanted to come, get you to come down here because I've got to ask you a question. I was asking Rahul yesterday at a Standard Chartered event, what, um, what was happening with the depressed bond market in Asia and what share of green and thematic bonds were? And you told me an astounding figure, Rahul. Come on, just go to the microphone for a second. What, sh what share of of bonds that are green or sustainable, Rahul, in the in the Asian market, despite the reduction of bond market. Well, how's it going? What's the, how's it travelling? Trust Sean to put you on the spot. Uh, yeah, so the, the number was actually 33%. So when you look at this year, where Asia X Japan G3 bonds are, are down, bonds themselves just are 50% down uh, in Asia. The most interesting uh, piece of statistic that I can find for clients here is 33% of all bonds, conventional or otherwise, are ESG labeled. That was 8% three years back, 20% about last year, 33 now. That's, that's something encouraging. Thank you. That's pretty extraordinary that this is happening anyway. So that's a lesson learned for all of us. As bond markets rebound, you're going to see an extraordinary change. This is my segue now to Eugene. Tell us about the work of the ASEAN Taxonomy Board, Eugene, and also what you're seeing around appetite, because you know you and I have been talking about green bonds in particular ever since you were working for regulators when you were Malaysian Securities Commission before. It's changed a lot. What are you seeing, and what are you doing? Hi, Sean. Well, uh, first of all, I must uh, commend technology. Raul actually beamed into the uh, uh, conference I'm at in Hanoi, and now I'm beaming into the conference he that he's at in Singapore. Um, so, Sean, you know, you and I have been uh, working a lot on green bonds and sharing a vision. And uh, we first started in Southeast Asia with the ASEAN Green Bond Standards, if you recall, and that's something that you were involved in as well. And in ASEAN at that time, we decided in 2017 that we needed to have a common definition and we wanted to experiment with one. Uh, so we used the ASEAN Green, uh, we used the uh, IGMA Green Bond Principles to uh, create the ASEAN Green Bond Standards. But again, you remember, Sean, it was a very uh, interesting uh, experiment because we decided to specifically exclude fossil fuels. Now, no one else had done that at that time. And... I remember us having this conversation and you're awfully encouraging that we should do this and we did do it. Uh, in 2018, we released the ASEAN Sustainability Bond Standards and the ASEAN Social Bond Standards. And today we have uh, 26 over billion in label 
green social and sustainable bonds and another three over billion in specifically aligned. So this kind of goes to show that A, um, investors do appreciate an ASEAN asset class and B, um, it's actually okay to provide more ambitious definitions because there will be investors who come for it. Um, so what we're doing in ASEAN right now is really phase two. Now, the second phase is really to get all our member states on board. And as you know, um, there's great diversity in our member states. So we have countries with very different starting points, very so different social and economic uh, uh, perspectives and situations, and of course, very different resources. I always like to tell people this to illustrate the diversity in the ASEAN states. So the highest GDP per capita per annum amongst ASEAN states is 60,000, and the lowest is 1,300. So how do you really bring countries that are so diverse together? Well, you can let everyone go off and have their own national taxonomies, which obviously like you, you shared, is something that we do encourage our countries to do because all member states will be uh, addressing their national priorities through their national taxonomies. But we also do want something to reflect the national ambition. We want something to be able to bring all our member states along this ambitious pathway to reach a common destination uh, and we must be able to encourage them. So you know that story many of us here or many of, many of us have experienced about kids who drop out of school uh, simply because they can't keep up with the requirements, they can't keep up with the, uh, the demands or what they're expected to do, but really they could have done quite well if they're given the right encouragement and the right tools. So it's the same uh, in Southeast Asia. What we want to do is to ensure that everyone starts the sustainability journey right now. We'll have countries who are not equipped in terms of data. We'll have countries who are not in, equipped in terms of infrastructure. We'll have countries who are not in, equipped in terms of resources. But that doesn't mean that they can't be and won't be. How do we start that process going? And that is what the ASEAN taxonomy is about. The ASEAN taxonomy is really the overarching guide for ASEAN. It's the common language for ASEAN. It's the guide reel for ASEAN. It's supposed to bring us all along on that journey we may all be at different starting points, but we want to be at the same ending point. And therein lies the big opportunity and also the big challenge. What does it mean to have a taxonomy that's inclusive, that's the overarching guide, and importantly, is going to facilitate transition in the region? So we've constructed the uh, ASEAN taxonomy to do two things. The first is we don't want to ignore the global efforts that are being undertaken, right? I mean, taxonomies were really created to reduce fragmentation. But if you have 30 taxonomies floating around, it's just going to increase fragmentation. So the first thing we've done with the taxonomy is actually to ensure that it is, in terms of design, interoperable, right? We have to worry about the thresholds later on, but in terms of design, it needs to be interoperable with the major taxonomy. So let's just compare against the EU taxonomy. The EU taxonomy has six environmental objectives. We have four. Those four and six virtually encompass the same things. We use ISIC as a, as a classification uh, system. The EU uses NACE. We know we can reconcile those two. EU has the DNSH criteria. We've got that. But we've thrown in an extra criteria, which is remedial measures to transition. I think, Sean, you and I talked about this too, right? Because we can't get to that perfect point immediately. Uh, we might have to actually uh, do things which we prefer not to, but we have to do it. So let's see how we can remediate those things, how we can mitigate those impacts. So that's additional for us is to facilitate transition. Um, we have a foundation framework that's principles-based. Essentially, that's an activity classification system. We recognize that there'll be countries and companies who can't come on with the data immediately, but hey, let's not stop them. Let's start them on that journey. And we have a plus standard, which basically reflects all the, um, the technical screening criteria, which other taxonomies are using. We have a, that's based on the traffic light system. So the whole taxonomy is based on the traffic light system. And the traffic light system, again, really enables us to concentrate a bit on the transition. Um, so back to transition, we have a plus standard, which has a technical screening criteria. What's going to be a bit different uh, with this plus standard compared to what's happening in other places is that we don't have a single threshold for economic activities. Well, in fact, we can have up to three thresholds. And why is that the case? It, it, it's, again, uh, intentional because we're trying to facilitate transition. So let's take energy as an example. So if we say, well, you know, our threshold for energy is like the EU, 100 grams per kilowatt hour. Not everyone's going to be able to do that. 
But you know, maybe people can do 250, maybe they can do 350. So we had three thresholds. We'll be able to encourage our member states to use these three thresholds, assemble it in a way that they can use to facilitate the transition journey. I often use this um, metaphor, it's like crossing a river. So, you know, the river's broad and narrow differently at different points. Uh, and if you had three stones to use as stepping stones to cross the river, and people at different points of the river, they'll arrange the stepping stones differently. And that's what we want uh, our member states to do in the tiers. But I think importantly, we also encourage uh, companies within our member states to be able to move on to something higher than what their country is using, because this is about getting on that journey as soon as you're ready and making yourselves ready as soon as possible. So really, the ASEAN taxonomy is the overarching guide and common language. It's meant to keep us all honest, keep us all within the guide rails. It's meant to complement uh, our national initiatives and move us as quickly as possible because we know that perfect isn't good enough, but we must be ambitious enough and we must avoid the lock-ins. And I'll just stop here for now, Sean. Fantastic, Eugene. Thanks. Um, quite a journey. Yolanda, we first met when you were in Standard Chartered, that's Rahul Sheff's organisation, a while ago. Uh, but I discovered recently that we had a common friend, Tessa Tennant, who was um, the, the doyen, uh, one of the founders of the responsible investment industry, really. So you've been on a long journey of trying to drive change in multiple institutions, and then you've had this very cool gig, the DBS for a while, and one of the things you've done is taxonomy work, right, implementation. Of course, banks and corporations and so on ask, is this going to be hard? Is this going to be difficult? I mean, can't I just keep it easy and have, say, like a uh, nice gentle 2050 target? Um, can you tell us about your experience internally? Great. Well, every time I speak to Sean, he betrays my age by suggesting that we've known each other for decades. <laughs> um, when DBS first thought about, okay, we are headquartered in Singapore, our primary markets are emerging economies, what should we do about sustainable finance? Um, we kept thinking about what would be realistic. And then um, we decided to develop this transition finance framework and taxonomy which is considered really foolhardy to do because taxonomy should be the work of markers, regulators, think tanks like CBI, not a bank to try to dictate what is right or wrong. But the approach that we took was to look at the origin of the word taxonomy. It's always very funny that we try to appropriate scientific terms, adopt it in finance, but taxonomy really is talking about what science says. And we go down to the root, look at what science says, rather than thinking what society says, what public opinion says, what the economy says will be feasible. So I think I really agree with what Eugene said, that a traffic light system that many of the recent taxonomies have adopted is a very realistic way of understanding what is that label referring to. Uh, we want to get credibility to the things that we finance if certain economic activities are not in the, econ in the taxonomy, that tells you something. That doesn't preclude financing later on, but it does tell investors the signposting of the attributes, whether it's sustainability or not, uh, of those economic activities. So, so that's one thing that we have done. We look at science. Another thing that we approach taxonomy is that because we were thinking about transition finance, and we looked at what is what was in the market. Most of the transition finance guidance is very principles based. So everyone is trying to skirt around the edges, not talk about what actually is transition. Um, and as a result, we find that it is a void that we would like we would attempt to fill. So for our taxonomy at DBS, we didn't try to map every economic activity under the sun. We only map the economic activities that we already finance. Um, and we put out a table looking at the alignment with the international best practices, such as the taxonomy that CBI has, um, and ECMA and others. But we try to make it beyond principles-based. We also want to approach transition finance not only relying on the taxonomy. So when we are evaluating transition finance deals, we really would be looking at 
the asset or the facility or the activity that we are financing plus the borrower, the counterparty, the entity that we are financing, do they really are on a pathway to transition? Because we are not going to finance a firm or coal company's individual biomass plant and say that is transition. But we have done something to that effect because we have looked at the borrower's overall strategy. So I think for us, the challenges we try to overcome by looking at not just the individual asset attributes, but also at the organization. Uh, how hard has this been? Not so much to build the taxonomy, but implementation, looking at lending programs, getting bank offices engaged. Has that been straightforward? Has it been really challenging? It has been challenging with clients who looked at transition that particular label under a taxonomy as some sort of inferior label that they believe that I would prefer being called green if I could. I don't want transition. So it took a little bit of convincing and education and I think with the emergence of a lot of the recent taxonomies focusing on transition in the amber part of the traffic light has helped. It has been also difficult internally at the bank because people actually talk about transition finance with different interpretations. Some people actually talk about transition finance interchangeably with sustainable finance because they're thinking, oh, I'm transitioning the economy, hence it is transition finance. But we apply that label very judiciously. We look at the organizational strategy. We look at the individual asset that we are financing. We benchmark it against a reference pathway that is hopefully 1.5, if not, you know, not too high uh, temperature um, uh, indication. So with all that coming into play, we have not done that many transition finance deals, uh, but we're quite proud of some of the ones that we've done, including some that are quite contentious because the counterparties involved, the borrowers involved, would be the fossil fuel clients looking to divest, diversify, decarbonize. Uh, Nadia, in the European taxonomy, we've incorporated transition within the broader sustainable universe there. The, the, the transition terms got confused and muddied and isn't very, let's, uh, I, I think, or at least this is what people are telling me in Singapore today, isn't, well, isn't very visible in the European taxonomy. We've also got enabling, we've got resilience and so on. I'm wondering your thoughts about the utility, given you've got a broader perspective on the bond market in U Europe as well. And then I also would like you to pick up on the utility question, what sort of things we're doing to make the electric car easier to push the button on, to give everyone a flavour. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, I think transition, you're completely correct, is, is actually widely misunderstood for the EU. Uh, so the narrative around the EU taxonomy is that, you know, the thresholds are very high, there's very limited numbers uh, of companies that are seen to be substantially contributing to at least the mitigation or adaptation objectives as written in the current Climate Delegated Act. Um, Actually, the, the concept of transition exists, Sean, as you rightly point out. So there are transitional activities. So for example, in, in manufacturing, uh, steel, cement, et cetera, tracks uh, the EU emissions trading system, which you know, will have a trajectory to decarbonize over time. So those thresholds will change. But similarly, transition is actually baked into the technical screening criteria. So I'll give you an example. If you uh, build a house, uh, the expectation is on the energy performance being at a very high standard, ultimately top 15% of primary energy demand, um, or EPCA in, in kind of local European terms, of a brand new property. But that's not to say that if you have a very low and energy inefficient property, you can't improve it. So there's a separate technical screening criteria that looks at renovation and says, look, we want you to deliver 30% energy efficiency. That's great because that doesn't mean that you hit this EPCA level at the very maturity of that investment. It's just that you deliver 30% energy efficiency, which is clearly critical in Europe because you have a lot of old housing stock. And so you still want to encourage that movement. Um, the other thing that we've really noticed, Sean, just in terms of data, so um, there is an obligation right now on European companies to report something called the eligible 
portion of, of revenue, capital expenditure and, and operating expenses aligned to the tax on it. So eligible just means, is it captured? And then next year, you have to start reporting this alignment figure. Uh, what we've observed in the market, so there's about 2,000 companies in scope for this reporting. Um, already of them, just over 1,000 have started reporting these eligibility figures. Uh, and actually, what we're seeing is, is 50%, so just over 500 of them, are already voluntarily reporting alignment, so starting on that journey a little bit earlier in terms of testing out the process. One of the metrics that we are really seeing, and, and rightly so, is that the capital expenditure values, those are being aligned to the taxonomy, i.e. there's a commitment at maturity of that expenditure that you deliver a substantial contribution and do no harm. You have the opportunity to invest. So capital expenditure, ultimately funded or not funded by debt instruments, is, is the most important metric of transition. And quite rightly, look, turnover, yeah, it's not. And that's true. There are not many companies today that are performing and making revenue in a way that is aligned to 2050 net zero. Correct. But actually, the place you want to focus in is use of proceeds of debt instruments and capital expenditure that is aligning itself to these taxonomy criteria. And focusing on those numbers ultimately will yield you a turnover value. And when you look at financial organizations, they're required to report both. So this forward-looking capital expenditure, and they're reporting the turnover or revenue. And so you've got this current performance versus future performance metric that is reported today and gives a much cleaner picture. So when we start to play around with the data, Sean, there is already a transitional picture emerging. Um, and, and I think often the narrative is forgotten there, and there's a lot of narrative that the number's very small. And what I see in the media quoted is typically a turnover-based number, so the revenue performance, uh, which is fair. Um, so I think I, that, that maybe answers the first question. You talked a little on utility. Uh, so I'd mentioned just over a thousand companies have reported their taxonomy. Um, they have a very strict structure by which they do that. Um, are they having problems doing it? I think the answer is yes. Sure, sure. It's a new process and it's a complicated process. Um, we have observed in the report that you will see next week you know, a number of teething problems. Um, even sometimes in technical screening criteria, like we in the platform are asking, can I objectively determine yes, no? If Sean looks at a company and Nadia looks at a company, do we both say, yes, it meets these technical screening criteria? Uh, in not all cases is that possible. So some of them are a little bit subjective. They'll say words like minimize. Uh, Sean and I might have different opinions about what minimize means and whether a company meets that. Um, so that there is a layer of complexity. We've asked the Commission just to give some supplementary guidance and support to the market to help them through that. Um, and then probably the, the biggest ask, and, and I think this touches on Eugene's point a little earlier, is international application. So one thing we've observed in the market is non-EU companies are reporting using the EU taxonomy. So not their local taxonomy, but the EU. Uh, this includes Mexico, the US, um, obviously it includes UK and Norway with quite high numbers. Um, they are they're not actually in scope to have to report, but, but are choosing to. Um, and we, you know, we've been approached by a number of companies that say, my investors really want this taxonomy number. I don't really know what it means. Um, now, trickled in the EU taxonomy is cross-references to a lot of EU legislation. Um, I'll give you a very basic example. Like if I operate in an area of water stress, I have an appropriate license to do so. Uh, if I'm applying that internationally, I may be uh, operating in an area of water stress and there is no licensing provision. I can't go in my local jurisdiction and get such a license. So what does that mean for me? Does that mean I definitely shouldn't be operating in areas of water stress? Or does that mean I kind of can as long as I do it sensibly? And how do I show sensible? So those international comparisons of criteria are really critically important. And you will see we have actually in our usability report devoted an entire chapter to international operability and the importance of this. And also for the EU ultimately to recognise reporting. I think the, the main point Eugene was making, and it's quite right, although it's principles based, is when it is applied, you don't want a Asian company having to report on two different taxonomies or multiple different taxonomies to satisfy investors. So it is really important that if I am reporting under the Singapore taxonomy, that an EU investor can apply that value and state for my EU sustainable financial product that company counts as X percent aligned because it is aligned to its local taxonomy. And, you know, if there is one place of advocacy, and I know Eugene and I talk about this uh, a lot, is, is kind of really pushing on that international operability for it to, to work uh, over the long term.
Sean, I hope that appropriately addresses your question. P perfect. I think, Eugene, this is a segue to you. Um, from ASEAN, this equivalence issue, this is going to dog us unless we can sort it out, right? Where, where, but you've got a problem within ASEAN, haven't you? Or, or do you think that's going to work between, say, Singapore and Indonesia and Vietnam? Tell us where that thinking is about regional equivalence. Yeah, well, this is the big challenge that we have in ASEAN. As you know, ASEAN's not quite the um, regional bloc that the EU is. It runs a sovereign state, um, and it's it's really a cooperative arrangement under a charter. So the um, way ASEAN approaches things is through consensus and through inclusivity. But that's, a, in a way, a strength, uh, Sean, because if we left everyone uh, to their own devices, then we'd have a very fragmented uh, investment regime. And I think, you know, Nadia's point about the CAPEX is absolutely important. Uh, we want investments directed into this area. And the way you direct investments into this area is if people who are putting the money in understand what they're putting their money into and are comfortable with it. Um, so we really need to kind of like bring everyone into a journey of transparency, right? If you can't do something, it's all right. I mean, my mother used to say, always tell the truth as long as you know you're going the right way. And that's what we should do right here. Uh, so we, you notice that with the, the PLUS standard, which is our equivalent technical screening criteria, we actually are open to having multiple tiers. And the reason why we're having multiple tiers is eventually, hopefully, um, one of those tiers will resonate with each of our member countries. So every member country has a tier that they could look at. Now, they disclose that tier. Is that going to be the level that we really want from them? Yes, eventually, but not perhaps not today. But we want them to be able to set the target to say, well, I'm at tier three today, and I want to move up to tier tier two in 10 years, and another another 10 years we're at tier one. That's what we want them to do. That's what that's the ambition we want them to create. Now, if they can do that, then of course within ASEAN, we will have an understanding where everyone is at. And we can make this disclosure very transparent. Um, then it comes back to Nadia's point, right? That other um, jurisdictions will say, well, we recognize what these guys are trying to do. They can't get, I mean, they can't, and we don't expect them to get to a particular level immediately. I mean, transition is about avoiding social and economic dislocations anyway, but they've got a plan to get there, right? It's about the plan. They, they're going to allocate CAPEX towards this. So that settles um, the interoperability issue, whether it's amongst the ASEAN member states or it's ASEAN and the rest of the world. And I also wanted to touch on something Yolanda raised. I think it's really, really important that we understand transition is really not about kicking the can down the road or backloading. And again, this is where the tears in the taxonomy are important because we need people to be very clear that there is a plan to move up that technology that uh, tier uh, sort of regime that they are improving consistently. We don't want this backloaded, right? So 2050 is my net zero target, but hang on, I'm only getting to tier one in 2049. That's not what we want. We don't want the backloading. So the tiers are meant for you to be able to chart a pathway. Um, and that's how we hope that this will work. Okay. Uh, well, it sounds good, although I suspect there's lots of areas to argue and it could be complicated and for that reason I'm going to ask someone at a bank whether this is navigable because you're going to have different taxonomies in different countries. You've had to look at this Yolanda. Is he mad? No we agree with what Eugene is trying to do for ASEAN um, and similarly the individual ASEAN countries taxonomy will be consistent with the ASEAN version what I think would be important for all of us to bear in mind is what if there is no taxonomy? You know, there was, you know, not so long ago, there wasn't any taxonomies for us to fall back on and we look at the very crude, broadly described, very nebulously defined green categories under ICMA's first version of green bond principles and we thought, okay, well, if it is at individual organization's discretion, then a lot of things go. Um, so I think for a bank, when we look at a variety of taxonomies, what we want to follow would be ultimately what investors want. 
And we know investors do come in a spectrum. And we also know investors don't pour over the 100 pages of prospectors trying to work out is it aligned with what we want to or mandated to, um, to invest. Hence, the emergence of taxonomy to make it easier, to make it straightforward, that is usable. So I think um, taxonomy does serve a very important signal. It's not the be all end all. I'm very glad that there is actually a very contentious debate when the EU taxonomy was trying to work out, do we include gas, do we include nuclear? Because we know those industries are trying to lobby very hard to be included, knowing capital will be deployed to the green assets in you know the not so distant future it's not as if they feel taxonomies don't matter whether we are in it or not we'll get financing no they know the consequences of being included in the taxonomy is huge so i think um we see a role for common framework um when we have competing taxonomies we will look at what our primary investor base will be demanding uh, Yolanda is referring to the European Commission's, uh, European Parliament's re recent option of an amendment to the taxonomy, which brought in nuclear and gas. I'm going to talk about net gas, though. Uh, the nuclear is restricted, but is in there. And look, you know, while I'm frankly not a big fan of nuclear, although some of the smaller reactors look interesting, um, it is low carbon. Let's be clear about that. You know, so if you're going to do something which is low carbon, it's better to do that than a coal plant, no doubt about it. Uh, the gas inclusion, which was a deft political compromise by the president of the European Commission when pushed by Emmanuel Macron in Paris and uh, Angela Merkel in Germany, is has got so many caveats on it, it's a pyrrhic victory for the gas industry. Um, so the headline was, oh my, and I, I had calls from governments in Asgard, oh, so Europe's green light of gas now, we can guess gas now taxonomy. Well, the headline is bad. It's very confusing. But in practice, you can only build a gas plant if you're replacing a coal plant. And then you can only build it to 15% of the capacity of the coal plant. And then you have to prove that you couldn't have built a wind and a solar farm instead of that plant. And you have to make sure that within 15 years, it's very low carbon. In other words, you've got to... There aren't getting many plants built. This is impossible. So it's a bit of a pyrrhic victory. Understand that. We'll be publishing something about that soon to provide some more guidance. But it's messy because the headline is confusing. Given the conversation on the IPCC and the International Energy Agency right now is around the incredible leakage from the gas sector. We have in the first delegated act of the European Commission said that we must be measuring life cycle emissions. We provided an agnostic measure of emissions, 100 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour in the energy sector, but you also have to measure emissions from wellhead to usage because we found, and look at some of the maps we published in newspapers lately, this huge leakage in the Russian gas pipeline and also in Texas and also in other parts of the world, in Turkmenistan, which is blowing out all our figures, whilst Germany has increased its 50, by 50% 50 its uses of gas up to the war in Ukraine, for reasons we now understand were political meddling by Russia, let's just call it that way, their actual emissions profile seems to have grown much more once you take into account the leakage factors across the life cycle. So these are the sort of tough discussions we're having now in understanding taxonomy. But the good news is we're having those discussions at taxonomy development. So for those people who don't have time to follow the science, because to be honest, it's complicated, there are all these bodies, including the MAS-led group in Singapore, which, Nadia, you've been on too, haven't you? And I'm going to ask you about any differences you see so far, just for full disclosure, everyone, between where we're going in Singapore and where we've been in Europe around this, because these are the fora where these things are being discussed and being sorted out to make it easier for the rest of us. Nadia, are we on the same page between Singapore and Europe, or are there differences that are problematic? Tell us what you're allowed to tell us. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, there are certain amounts of what the work of GFIT 
has been doing that has been open to public consultation. I'm very happy to talk to that. Uh, and what you will see for those sectors is absolutely, Sean, there is alignment between the EU and Singapore. Uh, you know, within the debate of that group, we often focus on international operability. We often focus on usability debate. Uh, we look at current performance, to use Shane's point, um, in the domestic economy. Uh, and and then we look at what what are what are the signals? Uh, it's been interesting. Like the, the most recent debate is you know on the concept of this traffic light system, and actually maybe that lends itself really well, for example, to debt instruments. Uh, possibly less well to judging a whole company, uh, particularly if that company has multiple different revenue streams and activities that it's conducting. Um, and if you're doing that across four environmental objectives, that can be quite a kind of muddy colour that you end up with in terms of understanding what that company is doing. Whereas if you're looking at debt and you're saying kind of is that debt to Eugene's point at some point, kind of moving yourself out of let's call it a red status and into the amber status, we want to give you credit. And that's the one thing the EU regime doesn't do. You can move out of red status, but only if you achieve green status do you really get recognition for that that product. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and then just generally in, in technical screening criteria, we are certainly aligning to the EU where we can, where it's feasible to, and considering the amber uh, as an approach in local economy. transition uh, specifically but what about industrial transition what color is there in that what can we learn you know, the steel sector the shipping sector which is so big in Singapore of course where is that gone just give it a bit of a flavor we need to move to wrapping up I appreciate it. we could talk for a while about that but I just want to find out where are you at on industrials Eugene, can you hear Sorry, us? Sorry, was that a question? Was that a question for me? Because my my mic, my sound's breaking up it, a little. Bit. It's a question for Eugene, the man oh. approaching camera. Where are you at of right. industrials, shipping, right. Sorry, steel? Sean. Yeah, it, you kind of broke up, and I didn't get an audio, so I assumed that wasn't for me. But <laughs> yeah, I think industrials are an important area, and you know, certainly. Let, let me talk a bit more about the SMEs. I think that's a really, when you talk about industrials, we need to talk about the SMEs as well, right? So you've got the heart, the bigger heart to abate sectors. Uh, certainly we've got to deal with that. And just, just to also share with everyone, when we started the ASEAN taxonomy journey after releasing version one, we had a massive stakeholder consultations with the real economy players. And it, it's very clear that for them, um, we must uh, position that transition carefully, right? Because transition is the balance between ambition and reality. And these two are really, uh, I, I, I would say, uh, have a healthy tension. Uh, so these two forces have a very healthy tension. If we don't push the ambition far enough, then the reality is always going to be a straggler. And if you don't push the, the reality uh, enough, then you have an ambition that cannot be achieved. So we're always trying to get that ambition right. So first, hard to abate sectors. I think this is something we really need to get correct. Uh, it, we are, ASEAN is generally an emerging economy block. These things are important to help us with our decarbonization journey. But again, uh, we must be very clear that the exits are there. I think that's the first point. The second is with the SMEs, right? Because when you talk about industrials, we also need to talk about the SMEs who form the backbone of the Southeast Asian economy. I think the bigger challenge for us is how do you get the SMEs on board? Because, you know, they don't have transition plans, right? And again, coming back to this thing about transition plans, many people think that transition plans are standalones. They are not. They're actually plans that should be integral to a company's strategy and business. And you actually need them for structural transformation. It's not a question of having it just to please a banker, an investor, a customer. Now, I think what is really important is that we build a sustainable finance ecosystem, which has the taxonomy, transition pathways, and disclosure. And we move everyone along that ecosystem to ensure that we have structural transformation. I saw Sean looking at this watch, I'll stop. That's good, that's good. Uh, look at the watch because we're out of time. Great finish, Eugene. Thank you so much. Yolanda, last thoughts, last reflections for us about where this is going and what we can expect going forward. 
Well, if I may, I actually want to answer your last question, which oh, was about it. industrial decarbonization. I think this is where we expect to see a bit more technical screening criteria, the adoption of a threshold quite useful. So for example, you talk about um, mining, you can have a nickel mine, you have, can have a smelter, you can have the captive power plant, and then you look at the carbon intensity per unit of production. And if you have a number that kind of indicates the ballpark of what a low carbon ferro nickel is going to look like, that number would be the reference, whether you're above or below, whether you are co-firing with biomass or you're only using thermal coal, any of the industrial processes in the smelting that can be decarbonized. So I think in some economic activities, the technical screening criteria, the threshold can come in very handy for evaluation. And I'm glad you'd better segue. We've got a mining mineral critical minerals working group starting <laughs> at the moment. So we'll be publishing a climate bonus criteria and providing that information to everyone else um, over the next six to six to eight months. And in fact, just to give you a sense of the forward agenda here, um, we're looking obviously at industrials, the steels I mentioned earlier, our cement criteria published today, but also we're looking at resilience. And you've heard a lot today about the importance of addressing resilience, but our understanding of necessary resilience is weak. We are, you know, adapting our water systems without necessarily looking at appropriate adaptation planning. In fact, we're still building water systems in the UK that are not consistent with the changes that are coming through the system. The famous Thames Gateway that was stopped flooding on the Thames was built in, in 1995 it actually is going to be breached sometime in the next 10 years because they didn't take into account climate change. So we have to build a whole new one. We're doing one further downstream in Thames. This is a global issue. Understanding what the nature of resilient investments are and the level of resilience, and resilience isn't quite the same as adaptation. It doesn't mean building a seawall that can't be breached. It means understanding things will get flooded we need to rubberize the electronics in the subway so we can just pump the water out the next morning and it'll start working again. That's a resilience approach, if you like. It's necessary, but it's also social resilience. We've learned from the pandemic what we have to do to get our societies back together again when we have a crisis. Economic resilience, shock absorbers and so on. The European Commission's social bond to finance unemployment relief in the middle of the pandemic is an economic shock absorber. We need to institutionalize these things when we have these kind of crises going forward. What does health sector resilience look like? Well, we've learned something in the last couple of years. It means having PPE equipment available. Because if you don't, it's going to be really bad for your health workers, let alone people who are going to be dying as a result of pandemics, etc. Vaccination investments, research. These are necessary investments, not just because they're important, but because climate change brings constant volatility in the physical and also the health environment. Pandemics are a feature of climate change according to the IPCC. Conflict, mass movement of people, all of these require thinking about how we can address these in advance, including, by the way, food. Well, we've learned over the last few months with massive food spikes, we've seen the beginning of famines which have I think it'll ease off a little bit thanks to a drop in food prices, but this is a big risk going forward. How do we address this? Some of this will be in being a bit more resilient and growing food locally. Singapore has a target of 30% urban food production by 2030, for example. That's a resilient strategy. There's a lot to be done. The opportunity is, of course, incredible as a result. Rahul and Yolanda will see a lot more green bonds and green finance and sustainable finance as a result if we can get our taxonomy right, if we can get our guide rails right. So I look forward to that conversation of all of you. Eugene, I guess resilience is not quite there. You focused on taxonomy. Have I said anything out of court? I need to check in with Eugene because he's my ASEAN mentor. Well, Sean, I think we've been mentoring each other and for the better. Um, so abstaining, I think resilience is something which is naturally built into this. When we talk about the sustainable finance ecosystem, what the taxonomy is just one part of it, it's one of the three pillars. And that ecosystem must be able to create a mutually reinforcing um, 
uh, self-contained system between uh, the real economy and the financial system. And that really must be able to bring us on that ultimate destination of resilience that we all need. Fantastic. Thank you, Eugene. Thank you, Yolanda. And thank you, Nadia, all the way from London for joining us today. Please give them all a clap. Fantastic panel. And fantastic work. More to the points.